So. Okay. All right, so let me take the videography here first. Uh, salaries at UNM because of a lack of funding are very low. Yeah. So this is the sort of way in which people get paid. Um, of course, the football coach and the basketball coach make more than the president of the university. <laughs> or are paid, they don't make anything. But, uh, they're paid more than they except interest. They may, uh, yeah, so that's basically a scandal. So we're, we're, uh, I'm going to talk about um, the vertex of uh, this um, term, and of course this term comes from first order, the first order term, and uh, once you've used the three fields to deal with the external particles, the only thing that's left is the gamma. And, um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is the correction to that, a one-loop correction. And in particular, that leads to the um, formula for the, uh, for the magnetic moment of the electron to order E squared, which was first calculated by Julian Schwinger in 1948. Now I'm trying to find where in my notes this starts. Um. Ah, here we go. By the way, the war, um, I think there was, uh, the, the, I think there was a, at least one sign error in the, in my lecture on uh, Wednesday of last week. But um, the notes online, I think, are, are correct. Um, these are uh, these are listed. The link is class notes. So uh, let's look at um, what this is. And if you simply Weinberg applies Feynman's rules and gets for this diagram the following. So this is momentum p going in. This is P prime going out, this is K, this is P minus K, this is uh, P prime minus K here, and this, you can call it Q, but um, it's also P prime minus P. And so if you actually apply Feynman's rules, what you get is integral d fourth k e gamma b 2 pi to the fourth minus i over 2 pi to the fourth minus i p prime slash minus k slash so this is this propagator over p prime minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And then the gamma a, so that's from this vertex here. And then minus i over 2 pi to the fourth minus i p slash minus k slash parenthesis missing plus m so I've got no two parentheses are missing here uh, p minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon and then um, E gamma B, 2 pi to the 4. And then finally, the propagator of that photon, which is 
minus i over 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over k squared minus i epsilon. So that's the expression. Uh, this, if you count powers of k, you see that you've got k to the sixth in the denominator, but you've got a k squared in the numerator and a d fourth k, so this is log divergent. So a logarithmic divergence isn't so bad. Um, and in fact, the remarkable thing is that um, the magnetic moment, the correction, the magnetic moment of the electron is uh, due to a part of this integral that's actually finite. And uh, so there's no renormalization required in order to compute that. The first step in uh, dealing with this interval is to use another of Feynman's tricks, which is to write 1 over 2 ABC, I'm sorry, 1 over ABC as integral 0 to 1 dx, integral 0 to x dy, and then 1 over ay plus b x minus y plus c 1 minus x, and all this cubed. So um, now using Feynman's, I can't, using Feynman's um, trick, uh, I don't know actually if we need to assume that we regularize the integral or not, but um, I will assume from here on that um, we uh, regularize the integral. Um, and one way, actually, of regularizing the integral is imagining that um, that uh, you take the value of this um, term at uh, when both p's are zero. Um, you imagine uh, that you take that from experiment and uh, so then you write this, this as the experimental value plus the difference between this integral and this integral with p and p prime equal to zero. And I think that is then finite, and you can just go ahead with the calculation. Um, how general this sort of thing, this sort of subtraction procedure is, I don't know. In particular, in vacuum polarization, you've got a quadratic divergence, and so, uh, so well, that's a trickier business, uh, and I'm not quite sure how it works. Yes. Yes. Have some questions. Uh, yeah. First question is: is on the term that you have for the profit for the outgoing, uh, I guess what, what would you call it, like fermionic propagator or something? You're, you're talking about this one? No, 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 no. For this the, one? No, for the mass field. For the mass. No, up there. This yeah, one? yeah, that guy. Should there be a plus n at the end there? Or no, is there no plus n? I mean, there's a plus n in the other one. Yes, yes, one. yes, yes, thank yeah. you. Sure. Uh, number two, um, I'm wondering about this extra little uh, photon propagator. Stick well, I guess it's not a propagator because it's not like closed off on two this vertices. This one here? No, no, on your diagram. So this extra, the extra photon going off to the left. Oh yeah, do we do we care about that? Is well, that of any consequence? Well, that's a matter of convention and definition. What what Weinberg and other people mean when they compute this thing mm -hmm. and call it capital gamma, mm -hmm. they mean that they're going to leave off this propagator, this propagator, and that propagator. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So that's and moreover, they're also leaving off corrections to this propagator, corrections to that propagator. And as much as leaving off the propagator, it makes sure. sense to leave off the corrections to it. Sure. Um, okay. And if you didn't leave them off, it would just give you some like... Here, wait, 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 I don't know how many of these you... Yeah, it's fine. Uh, and if, if you did include those, you would just have some like e to the i k x sort of thing going on? 
Oops, we would have like some e to the i q x or something like that if you didn't leave off those endpoints because you have some like free momenta or something. But I guess we're looking in momentum space, so since we're calculating these Feynman diagrams in momentum space, I guess we actually just wouldn't even have anything if we concluded if we included those. Or um. I mean, generally, like an outgoing particle, you just add like a term, right? Like there's like some well, but, for I mean, if you have an outgoing particle. Well, if you have an exponential, you're like, integrating overall space yeah. anyway. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it goes, so it turns into a delta. Okay. Yeah. Those just give you delta functions and serve momentum or something. But like good that. questions. Okay. Okay. So we apply Feynman's trick, and we assume we um, coped. We've made the integral finite by a subtraction or some other uh, trick. The standard thing that Weinberg does to make this finite is something that was introduced by Pauli and Villars, and uh, it's to change the photon propagator by um, imagining that there's a heavy photon and then subtracting that uh, that putting in a minus 1 over k squared plus lambda squared minus i epsilon. Um, and uh, that works in this particular case, but the thing that I suggested also works. Anyway, if we do this, um, the final trick, what we get is we were able to write the denominators p prime minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. 1 over p minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. 1 over k squared minus i epsilon. But we're able to write the three of these as twice an integral 0 to 1 dx, 0 to x dy. And then 1 over a huge denominator which is um, p minus p prime minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon y plus p minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon x minus y plus k squared minus i epsilon one minus x, and all this cubed. So then, what um, what happens is you can of course combine these things. Well, let's see. I forgot the curliness of the brackets, and you can um, rewrite this as two integral dx from zero to one, integral dy zero to x. And then you get something that's both simpler, but also um, uh, so let me write this. Let me see what I've got here. I think right. This there are some parentheses issues here. Um, so I think what we've got here is k minus p prime y minus p x minus y, and all of that is squared plus m squared x squared, and then plus q squared y x minus y minus i epsilon q. So that's what we've got. And now, once again, we imagine that we've made the integral finite. And so we can shift the variable k from k to k plus p prime y plus p x minus y. And that simplifies the denominator. It means that the numerator gets more complicated because everywhere you have a k, it suddenly becomes a, a much more complicated thing, a sum of k plus these two terms. But if you do that, the net result is, is, is simpler. And so what you have is that 
gamma of p prime p is then 2i e squared over 2 pi to the fourth integral 0 to 1 dx, integral 0 to x dy, and then integral d fourth k. And now what you've got is gamma b. I'm just wondering if I have these parentheses right. Let's hope so. Anyway, minus i times p prime slash 1 minus y minus k slash minus p slash times x minus y plus m. And now a bigger bracket, and we have a gamma a. And then another big bracket, minus i, p slash 1 minus x plus y minus k slash minus p prime slash y plus m gamma b. No, it's a lower b. And then all of this is divided by a denominator, but the denominator is simple because we shifted k. And so the denominator is k squared plus m squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y minus i epsilon q. Okay, so that's what we've got to deal with and it's, um, as I said, it's a law of divergence. But now, Kevin, sorry, uh, yeah, go ahead. So on this, oh, sorry, Jesus. Nice. <laughs> I still call it. Um, <laughs> bottom row over here, is that a Q? Is it Q squared? What? This is a Q. Okay. So where does... Yeah, what's the relationship between... I don't see the Q and good, anything good, else. Good, good point. What the hell is Q? I, uh, Q is P prime minus P, but uh, what I don't see is how it is that this popped into the expression um, without any notice, so let me write that down. Is it P prime minus P or P? Yeah, P prime minus, minus P. P. So Q, Q is the momentum of the photon, which is P prime minus P. So P plus Q is P prime. So Q is P prime minus P. And um, so let's see if we can see where this popped in. Um, the preceding line was up here, and we're going to shift P. I'm, I'm sorry, we're shifting K, and So let's see, where is there a... Well, uh, the thing is that after you, uh, I mean, I skipped a line here. You've got to take all of these expressions, and when you take all of those expressions to form something relatively simple, you have a Q, which is P prime minus P. What happened to K? Huh? What happened to K? Oh, wait, no, K is still there. It's yeah, K, K is K here. Down. Cool. Awesome. And what is kind of remarkable is that before shifting, well, it's a, it's a, All right, let me not try to fill that in. I mean, if you want, you want me to fill in the... I just wanted to make sure I was reading that. Yeah, you're reading it right. Q is P prime minus P. So we now shift the thing, and after we've shifted, the numerator becomes more complicated. 
but the denominator is much simpler. The next thing is the wick rotation. So in particular, we set k0 equal to i k4, and we integrate k, so the integral d4 k turns into i, or is equal to, I should say. Well, it's equal to, apart from a ghost contour, it's equal to uh, dk1, dk2, dk3, dk4, everybody from minus infinity to plus infinity. And uh, once we have once we've done the wick rotation, we don't really have to distinguish between indices that are up or down. Um, everything's um, up effectively. And the advantage of that is that this k squared then becomes strictly positive, and um, we can forget about the i epsilon. And you might say, well, um, hold on, how do you know that? Well, first of all, y only goes up to x, so this structure is positive. If q squared, and, and also, we're going to rotate q. So, um, uh, so, let's see. Actually, we don't even need to rotate q because there isn't any q in the numerator. But um, otherwise, we're just going to assume that q squared is positive. Because if q squared is negative, there's still a pole here, and one needs the i epsilon. So we're, we're sort of tacitly assuming, assuming that q squared is positive. Um, so once we do that, we can then do this integration. And so this is an integral in which um, in which, as far as the denominator goes, you have O4 symmetry in the denominator because this is just the length of a vector k in four space, Euclidean four space. And so you can do the integral. So what you know is that in the numerator, in the integral, any terms in the numerator that are odd in k uh, are going to vanish because we've made the integral finite also. And um, but we haven't said explicitly how. In any event, so all the odd terms in K are going to cancel, and um, in order to do the K integration, we need the area of a unit sphere in four dimensions, and we just use the formula that we derived last time, which is pi to the 4 over 2 divided by gamma, of 4 over 2. And we use Bobby's result for 2 fat, gamma of 2 fat of 2. And um, so then what we get is simply 2 pi squared. So 2 pi squared is the area of the unit sphere in four dimensions. And um, so now this integral here is equal to, maybe I should Right again. P is equal to minus 4 i squared e squared over 2 pi to the fourth integral 0 to 1 dx, 0 to x dy, and now integral 0 to infinity. And I'm just going to let k be the length. So k squared is just k1 squared plus k2 squared plus k3 squared plus k4 squared. And um, so here we're going to have k cubed dk. And then we put in the area of the unit sphere. And um, that has already gone into this factor. And the rest of this is u bar prime gamma a minus k squared plus 2m squared x squared minus 4x plus 
two plus two q squared y x minus y plus one minus x and then plus four i m p prime a y minus x plus x y plus four i m p a x squared minus x y minus y now close parenthesis u and then in the denominator, you've got this uh, k squared plus m squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y cubed. Okay, and this is really a curve. Okay, I hope the parentheses all make sense. Um, so um, I should say that there's been a, a, a certain amount of gamma out, gamma matrix algebra that's gone into this, gone into going from there to there, because um, over here you see we have p prime slash, and we have a, uh, a gamma b, a gamma a, a gamma b. So and we have slashes here. So altogether we've got things involving five gamma matrices. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I skipped a I skipped an equation. Damn it! This that was stupid. Um, all right, so let me let me write the equation down that I skipped. The equation. So it's. This is the equation that I should have written down. Minus 4 pi squared e squared over 2 pi to the fourth. Integral 0 to 1 dx. Integral y, dy 0 to x. Integral 0 to infinity k cubed dk. And now, these gamma matrices that I mentioned are gamma B, gamma C, gamma A, gamma C, gamma B over 4, and then plus uh, gamma B minus I P prime slash 1 minus Y minus P slash X minus Y. Uh, plus M gamma A and then um, minus I P slash 1 minus X plus Y minus P prime slash Y plus M gamma B and then all over that denominator which is k squared plus m squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y cubed. Okay, so this is what one gets. And then um, what happens is one then takes the matrix element of this between the spinners u of p and u of p prime. So when you put those spinners there, and in fact I forgot to put the spinners there, so this is u bar prime, or if you want more explicitly, u bar of p prime, u of p. So you put the spinners on the outside of this expression, and then what happens is you can use Dirac's uh, spinners which obey Dirac's equation. So in other words, you have 
u bar prime i p prime slash plus m is zero, and i p slash plus m u of p is zero. So to, to make this more explicit, this is u bar plus p prime. And just to remind you, u bar is u dagger theta, which is i u dagger m zero. And um, what one also can do with this is you can anti-commute the gamma C through the gamma A, and then you have uh, the gamma C times gamma C, and um, gamma C times gamma C is um, eta CC, so it's plus or minus one. And the same thing when you anti-commute the, the B through, gamma B through. Uh, so that's how you get rid of the gammas. And then for these terms, if you have a P slash acting on the U, when you put the U here, so I had the U in the equation, but I forgot to put the U and the U bar on the left-hand side. Um, when P slash, I P slash hits, it's, it's a U, you get a, um, an M, MU. IP slash U of P is MU of P. And of course, in this case also, you have to commute through the gamma Bs. And, okay, so there's a lot, a lot of gamma, there's a lot of algebra in um, this derivation. And now there's a, uh, there's something, uh, a way of simplifying this, and the way of simplifying it, well, let's see, I need to, I need to, right. Okay, let's go over to here. So, again, I should have gone there and then come over here. Now what we see is we've got two terms that are quite similar. And everything that is, is the same except this is P A and this is P prime A. And the coefficients are somewhat different. However, these coefficients are This is the x-axis, that's the y-axis. We're integrating over the xy plane. x from 0 to 1, y from 0 to x. And it turns out that if you replace, you, you replace y by x minus y, that's effectively uh, identifying this point, points on this line remain invariant, but this point goes into that point, and this point goes into this point. And so effectively, this whole half triangle turns into this half triangle, and the area of this triangle is half the angle of the area of the full triangle, so the area of the two triangles is the same. And so, what that means is that um, one can average these coefficients. And so this so what one does is one replaces both of these coefficients by their average. And their average is rather simple. It's minus a half x, 1 minus x. And so after doing those things, what we get is u bar 
of P prime and A of P prime and P U of P this is then minus 4 I squared E squared over where we are at this point. Now, a couple of things that we should um, think about. First is that this is a nice expression. <laughs> um, in the sense that it, it respects current conservation. So let me show you how that works. So I'm going to talk about physics a little in a somewhat more general way. Current conservation, of course, is zero is partial x. The eighth derivative of the jth component of the current just vanishes. So that's current conservation. Now, um, this matrix element here is closely related to an amplitude p prime a sub a of x j a of x p and um, if I expand the a the j a of x this is psi bar gamma psi bar of x gamma a psi of x p so that's why this is what we're talking about. And uh, the A goes away because that's just, so to lowest order it's this, and then the higher order is this, like that. So this is the term we're calculating, but basically it's um, a photon coming in and hitting a current and then the corrections to the current. And um, this A goes away because it just absorbs this photon. Okay. Now, um, let's look at what P prime J A of X P is. Well, this this is the current at space-time point x, and that is translated by the full momentum operator, P, from its value at space-time point zero. So this is translation, uh, this is how it trans... This is a unitary operator that implements a translation from zero to x. 
And um, on the other hand, this is an eigenvector of this momentum operator. And so we can rewrite this as p prime e to the minus i p prime dot x j a of 0 e to the i p dot x p. And now in this expression um, between the bra and the ket, um, everything is just a number apart from the current j a of 0. And so this is equal to e to the i p minus p prime dot x p prime j a of 0 p. And so now if we take the, der the derivative or the divergence of this current, we and use current conservation, we get zero. So zero is dA p prime ja of x p. So this vanishes by current conservation. On the other hand, this is dA e to the i p prime minus p, or is it p minus p prime? p minus p prime x p prime j a of 0 p. And so this is i p minus p prime sub a p prime j a of 0 p. So that's what, so what we expect then is that current conservation which as I, I, I think is, because I'm a theorist, and so I should, you should take with a grain of salt anything I say about experimental physics, but I believe that the current observation is the most um, accurately measured conservation law. Anyway, what this tells us then is that um, I P minus P prime so A, U bar prime gamma A U had, uh, well, this on, I should say, on the big gamma A, but so, so let me do. So what we expect is that this on gamma A, of p prime and p. This should vanish. And let's look at what it is. Well, there's a term proportional to gamma a, then there's a term proportional to p prime a, and a term proportional to p a. Well, the term that just has a gamma a, this works out nicely because it's p prime minus p a, u bar prime gamma a u. But then that is just u bar prime of p prime i p slash minus i p prime slash u of p. And i p slash on u is m. So this is u bar prime of p prime. This is m. And this is minus m on the other one. So this is m minus m u of p, zero. Um, and here I'm using the fact that, where did I write down Dirac's equations? And right. So what, I, what I'm using here is the fact, maybe we should put the camera over here for a moment, that Dirac spinners obey his, obey his equation. In particular, i p slash plus m sends u of p to zero, and u bar p prime parenthesis i p prime slash plus m is zero. Um, the other terms are 
PA plus PA prime times some number, and they work also because then what we have is P minus P prime sub A, P bar prime, P prime A plus P A U, and so this of course is P bar prime, it's P minus P prime sub A, P minus P prime P plus P prime sub A, U, and so this is U bar prime P squared minus P prime squared, and that is just U bar prime minus M squared plus M squared U, which again is zero. So, um, having gone through all this um, algebra and calculus and gamma algebra, and so forth, what we find is we get something that is proportional to gamma A and then proportional to PA plus PA prime. And those are exactly the terms that, that uh, satisfy current conservation. In fact, they're also the most general terms that would give you a four vector, a four vector uh, when put between uh, two spinners. Other things would not transform the right way. Okay, so now what we can do is um, what's traditional, namely we we write this as bar prime of p prime times gamma A F of Q squared minus I over 2M P plus P prime A G of Q squared U of P. And these things are called form factors. And of course, what they do is they tell you what is the what is the really microscopic physics that's going on, so that when uh, a photon hits a char hits an electron going by, uh, you get the right answer as opposed to um, just one factor of gamma a multiplied by just a number, and um, the magnetic form factor here is g of q squared, and this is minus 4 pi squared e squared over 2 pi to the 4. So this is, this is basically the electric and magnetic uh, form factors. And uh, uh, this is actually called the charge, uh, the charge form factor and the magnetic form factor. The magnetic one is 4 pi squared e squared over 2 pi to the 4, integral 0 to 1 dx, integral dy 0 to x, integral 0 to infinity k cubed dk. And now what we have is just 4m squared x 1 minus x over k squared plus m squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y cubed. Okay. Now, let's just go back here and look at this for a second. This is the part that involves p and p prime, not the part that involves gamma a. So notice the gamma A part has a K squared in it. Whereas the P and the P prime part have no gamma A, have no K squared. That's why this integral is, well, it's simpler also because the thing that multiplies gamma A is complicated. The thing that multiplies P and P prime is quite simple. 
and there's no k squared in the numerator, so this is actually a finite integral. It's uh, k to the fourth here, k to the sixth in the denominator, so this is perfectly finite. And um, in fact, if we um, we can in fact do the k integration explicitly, and um, we can use the formula that integral k cubed dk over k squared plus a squared cubed is 1 over 4 a squared. And so this gives us minus 4 pi squared e squared over 2 pi to the 4, 0 to 1 dx, 0 to x dy, and what's left is just 4 n squared x 1 minus x over 4 and I set a squared equal to that. And so we have here n squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y. So that's rather simple, and that's also converging. Um, y is less than x, so this term is positive. We're assuming q squared is positive. There's no pole in the denominator. And, um, so this is um, rather simple. In fact, we can cancel things a little bit. And we get minus e squared m squared over 4 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx integral 0 to x dy. And that's just x1 minus x over m squared x squared plus q squared y x minus y. Now, it turns out that this magnetic, that to compute the correction to the magnetic moment of the electron, what we're talking about, of course, is we're imagining that we have an electron sitting statically in a magnetic field and we, let's say, we flip the magnetic field and we see how much the energy changes. Or to put it differently, if you had a, an electron in a magnetic field and you turned on a radio frequency electromagnetic field, you could tune the thing until when it was that the what frequency would flip the electron back and forth. And um, but the point here is that the photons that you're using to do that are essentially q squared equal to zero. In other words, the magnet, the magnet, when we say the magnetic moment of the electron, we mean how the electron interacts with a photon of momentum zero. So we're going for q squared equal to zero. Well, when q squared equals zero, the y dependence drops out. And the integral from 0 to x dy is just x. And so this g of 0 is very easy to compute. And in fact, let me write down what the formula is for mu. Mu is e over 2m. That's Dirac's formula for the, uh, for the magnetic moment of the electron. So that's the. E over 2m is the magnetic moment of the electron to order E. To order E cubed, it's corrected by G of 0. And now G of 0 is minus E squared e squared over 4 pi squared integral 0 to 1 to x integral 0 to x dy x 1 minus x over m squared x squared so this, of course, simplifies to e squared m squared over 4 pi squared 0 to 1 dx 
this integral is just x, so we have x squared, and then what's left is 1 minus x over m squared. Uh, the m squareds cancel, the integral is just a half, and so this becomes minus e squared over 8i squared. So that's the correction. So that means that the to order e squared, this is e squared, I'm sorry, e over 2m, 1 plus e squared over 8 pi squared. And if we set alpha equal to e squared over 4 pi, then this is e over 2m, 1 plus um, alpha over 2 pi. And alpha, of course, is 1 over 137. And um, if we then divide by 2 pi, that's essentially 1 over 1,000. And um, the, the answer numerically is 0, 0, 1, 1, 6, 1 times e over 2m. So this was done by Schwinger, Julian Schwinger. in uh, 1948, and um, he announced the result at a, in fact, I think he did the calculation at an, uh, a meeting in the American Physical Society in 1948. Um, one can see it was, uh, one can imagine that it was quite well attended in that talk. Um, it's rather nice that um, the correction comes out to be so simple. In other words, alpha over 2 pi as opposed to some, you know, uh, some expression that is just some complicated rational number as opposed to or irrational number. Well, rational because you'd only write it as a finite number of digits, yeah. Is this the calculation of the magnetic moment of the electron that's like the best? Like it's it's like the best theoretical prediction to match experimental results. Oh no, I people have gone beyond that. Okay, of course. Okay. And in fact, um, I don't know what the current uh, level is. I can imagine that within five or ten years, people did a two-loop calculation, mm -hmm. and by now it's three or four loops. Um, and there was a, somebody at Cornell, somebody, some Japanese theoretical physicist, uh, Japanese American or American Japanese, whatever, guy at um, Cornell, who led a group that specialized in um, doing these higher order quantum electrodynamical calculations, and. Um, the, as far as I know, the, the, um, it goes for several more digits now and is in complete agreement with experiment. Mm -hmm. But um, I should qualify that by saying that I think that the level of calculation now is so high that one would take into account the weak interactions. Now, I mean, I say that off the top of my head, not having looked in the book and checked that, but um, uh, so the, what we have here is, so this is what we're talking about, and um, Well, an electron can emit a z, zero, which can go around. And um, 
So that that's just a one loop correction. But this would be down by um, uh, a factor of one over the mass of the Z zero, which is around 90 GeV. And that's huge compared to the scale of atomic physics. Um, and since that just replaces the photon, though, it just is a correction of order sure how, how to say it, but if, if we say it's of order m electron over mz squared, and I'm not sure that this is the, uh, the right way to do this, this is uh, 100 GeV, and this is half an MeV, so this is 10 to the minus 6 to get from, uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is half an MeV, I'm doing in GeV, so this is 10 to the minus 3 GeV times a half. So this is roughly 10 to the minus 5 squared. So this is of order 10 to the minus 10, isn't it? Did I do that right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, now, I'm not sure that the way in which that the contribution here is of that order, but it's plausibly of that order. Anyway, but there are all kinds of other things that would come in that, are, that would come in first. Um, there's that, and then, um, well, of course you could have this. Or you could have um, this. So there are all kinds of ways in which um, all kinds of thing, terms that can contribute. And um, I mean, it's, it's, you've got all of this. You can you can you can go to the particle data group and just look up. This the, has like fourteen digits. Oh, okay. Let me write it down then. Okay. So that was uh, it said as of two thousand seven. So. Yeah. I mean, assuming you believe Wikipedia is <laughs> the source of all knowledge. So this is five nine <laughs> six five two one eight zero oh, eight five. So this is 2007, and some group out of Harvard is what they said. And what's the theoretical? How many loops are they showing about? Right? Can you find out? So this is. So let's see. I said 10 to the minus 10 as a correction, but that's, I guess, relative to this. So we would have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we're, so the weak interactions are just sort of at the limit there. I, I would imagine that, I think I probably underestimated the effect. And of course there are also W's. Um, <clears throat> whether that's important or not, but you, well, I'm, all right, I'm, I'm just not sure quite how this goes, but, but it is true that in precision um, atomic physics, the effects of the weak interactions can be both computed and measured. Mm. And, um, and in particular, when you do ordinary atomic physics, you assume that you have invariance under parity. But the weak interactions, at least as far as we know, 
present theory, the standard model, violates the weak interactions maximally, uh, violates parity, the weak interactions maximally violate parity. And um, so there's a parity odd contribution in atomic physics that can be computed and then measured, and it works out. They don't measure I haven't seen the angle. By the way, the best place to go for information about particle physics is you go to the you, you Google particle data group. And it's free and it's online. In fact, you can even ask them to send you stuff and they'll send you um, they'll send you a little booklet and they'll also send you a um, their, their print version of their data. And the print version of their data weighs maybe a kilogram, two kilograms. I mean, it's, a, it's an issue of his rev or, or the Chinese Journal of Physics or the or European Journal of Physics that's that thick and it's pages of that big. And, um, Anyway, so that's the place to go for the best stuff about particle physics. Um, and whether they have act the best stuff about atomic physics, I'm not quite sure. There, um, the, uh, another place to go to find good things is NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Mm -hmm. I actually was there for two years back. In the previous century. Um, so let's see. I actually have run out of my notes again. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to say. Why don't you guys ask questions, just general questions? I have one general question. Yeah. So, wait, wait, wait. Here's your. Oh, yeah, so uh, yeah, you were saying uh, whenever we measure this magnetic moment, we're considering the electrons interacting with photons of zero momentum. What does that really mean? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, like, like how do you have to Oh, it means that... Is it like you're well, in a cavity and there's standing waves or something? Or? Well, it's, it's sort of what I said. In other words, um, it's, a, it's a static property of the electron. So in other words, it's... Literally, it's how much energy would you need. Suppose you have a magnetic field, an electron sitting at rest in a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. um, then um, what would happen? Well, the electrons would, if there would on average, be in the Boltzmann distribution okay. in the magnetic field. And in particular, you could ask how much energy would you have to supply to have the electron go from the low energy configuration, which might be spin up or spin down, to the high energy configuration, which then would be spin down or spin up. And, um, and um, so that would be, I guess, you, what you're talking about is this, this same diagram but where this is a very, very low energy photon that just flips the spin. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it, but in any case, the, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm making this much more complicated than it need be. The key thing is that you're interested in how much energy does it take to flip the spin of a, an electron that's at rest in a magnetic field. So that means that this P, is zero and p prime is zero, mm. so that's the, that's the why q has to be zero because oh. q is p prime minus p. Mm -hmm. So is there? Yeah, I, I have a question. In general, is the charge form factor f of q squared is that not finite? That's right. That's not finite. That's logarithmically divergent, and um, I guess I mean. Oh, well, I could maybe, well, I don't know. In two, two minutes, I don't think I can go through the computation. 
All right, on Wednesday, I'll go through that computation um, and show, um, in fact, I'll do a nice way of renormalizing it rather than the complicated way with counter terms, which strike me as being silly. I have one more question. Does it make sense to... Oh, wait a minute. You won't... You, you, you. To, does it make sense to talk about um, gauge fixing? In any of these angles, or choosing, well, you choosing don't, some gauge. Yeah, 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 okay. So, yeah, you were in here for the fall. Um, right. When you quantize the electromagnetic field, well, what you have to do first, at least conventionally, is you fix the gauge. Right. So, and in fact, what we do in um, uh, electronics, the simplest thing, let us say what, what Weinberg does, at least in volume one, is he goes to what's called Coulomb gauge right, and the or radiation gauge. gauge divergence of A to zero. In this gauge, the zero component of the electromagnetic field is an integral of the charge distribution at, uh, at the same time. And so this variable this is not something you have to quantize because it's a dependent variable. And this is this thing here is psi bar gamma zero psi. And um, so then you have two the two transverse degrees of freedom of um, A are what you quantize, and those are quantized with annihilation and creation of. So in other words, this has already been fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, it's been fixed, but um, there's something subtle. What happens is, um, after you do the quantization, you then find that when you analyze the Feynman diagrams and the propagator for the photon, that you see you've got this ugly term because the Hamiltonian has a term G0, A0 in it. And when you compute the propagator in the Coulomb gauge and you include the effect of this term in the Hamiltonian, they cancel and give you the nice propagator for the photon, which is just 1 over q squared minus i epsilon. So that's the subtle thing that happens. So in other words, you quantize an ugly gauge, but um, uh, mathematics saves you, and you wind up doing just very nice uh, calculations. All right, so let's go. Anybody starving and needs candy? I just ask you. <laughs>